Hi folks, Kevin here. Today I want to bring to you one of my passions, permaculture. And I thought I'd introduce my approach to permaculture or my introduction, uh, maybe my pseudo definition of permaculture. Because permaculture is really defined quite differently depending on where you go to find out information. And whoever you speak with usually is going to come up with a few different ways of describing what permaculture is. And so I thought I'd take some time today to share with you what I think permaculture is all about, or at least an introduction. Here we go. Okay, so permaculture is a, a really tremendous, a large, expansive topic, and I'm just going to give a, a, a really superficial overview as an introduction to what permaculture is about. First, definitions. There are so many definitions out there and they're really based on the permaculturist knowledge, their experiences, their approaches, their focus, their goals, how they've applied permaculture in the past. So there are many, many diff uh, definitions. One common definition is uh, uh, permanent agriculture or permanent culture. Uh, overly simplistic uh, but it at least gives you a little bit of an idea and I'd say go ahead and Google permaculture and, and see what other folks are, how they're describing it. Uh, the term was first coined, coined by Bill Molson and David Holgram in 1978 when they published Permaculture One. Uh, both were authors on this first text by uh, Bill, Bill Molson and David Holgram. Several other texts were produced by uh, Bill Molson over the next several years. And then David Holgram produced uh, Permaculture Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability in 2002. Uh, those are all, from what I understand, excellent resources. I, I'm not a big reader, but I have used some of these books as resources. One book that isn't uh, by David Holgram or Bill Molson is Gaia's Garden, and that's by the late uh, Toby Hemingway. Really a an amazing author and presenter of information, and Gaia's Garden is, is really an excellent resource. Permaculture really is both a movement and a philosophy. Um, and both movements and philosophies start with ourselves. We're the nucleus. We're where it all begins. It's a quest for positive solutions. It's permaculture is proactive and less reactive. Uh, you know, when I think about a comparison between those two, I think of Mother Teresa. And when people asked her, you know, why is it you don't uh, show up at anti-war demonstrations, she said she never would. But if you have a pro-peace rally, well, she'd be there. So that's a really good example of being proactive, trying to find the positive in something in a particular situation and trying to uh, do all you can to make the positive thing come out. A lot of us turn to permaculture because we see all the things that are going wrong in the world. And, uh, and I think we need to focus more on what the positive impact we can have. Permaculture is really, its foundation is based on natural systems, learning from natural uh, systems. Uh, working in conjunction with natural cycles and you know certainly the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, the photosynthesis and the water cycle. Understanding how these cycles work and how they they give life to all of the carbon-based units on the planet is a very important uh, component of, of becoming an informed permaculturist. Understanding the life sciences uh, certainly, you know, bi biology, botany, zoology, microbiology, physiology, biochemistry, and other related, uh, you know, living sciences. Certainly, it's not only including the life sciences, it's including, including physics, uh, uh, engineering, uh, chemistry. All sorts of different sciences are involved and realizing the importance of the interaction of each of these life sciences and geological uh, interfaces really help us to become better as far as designing more sustainable and uh, 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 adaptive systems. Uh, we're looking for in these life sciences both beneficial interactions and relationships as, as well as interdependencies of these living systems. 
Uh, we are always searching for the best, the ideal, and the least disruptive approaches. We want to uh, do as little harm as possible when we're imposing our design in a system to accomplish certain goals. Uh, when we talk about carbon positive solutions, uh, this day and age, we're, we're becoming increasingly aware of global warming and our carbon negative uh, applications that we've used in industry and in our ways of life. We sort of take it for granted where power comes from and, and so on and so forth. And certainly, you know, we've taken millions of years of solar energy in the form of uh, coal, oil, natural gas that we're harvesting and, and using at, at an alarming rate and we're consuming it all within just a, a, a couple of hundred years. Millions of years of sequestered carbon has been utilized and released into the atmosphere. And so trying to attain uh, car carbon neutrality is certainly a wonderful first step, but we need to strive for carbon positive solutions where we're sequestering carbon. So, for example, on our, on our demonstration site, we're fortunate enough to install a very large photovoltaic uh, system. And, uh, and we produce more energy than our needs. Uh, and the uh, solar panels nowadays have really come a long ways. They're much more efficient than they were in the past. Uh, they're reduced in physical side, therefore taking up less physical space on a roof or on a rack mount system. They're uh, much more economical to produce, the, so therefore the price is coming down in the photovoltaic cells. They're much more environmentally responsible and fewer resources are used, fewer resources are used to even ship the materials nowadays. Um, so permaculture is basically a philosophy working with rather than against nature. We're trying to meet all our needs while improving and enriching our surroundings. You know, this, uh, and I haven't gone over this, but, you know, uh, these are other future topics, but it's taking care of their, it's earth care, people pair, care, and fair share or return of surplus, however you want to look at it. Um, permaculture is a design process based on whole systems appreciation with appropriately apl applied reductionist approach, approaches. So reduction, reductionist, when, when we look at, you know, as a clinician, we're pretty much reductionist. We analyze and describe a part isolated from the, from, as a subunit from the whole. And, and that's a valid part of scientific research and observation and interaction. Take one component of a system out and, and testing it saying, all right, well, this seed didn't germinate. Did it have enough moisture? Did it have any contaminants in the soil? Did it get adequate sunlight? Did it have the, the appropriate type of, of soil? Was it the temperature optimal? So as a reductionist, we can take one component out, analyze it, and intervene appropriately. As a whole systems designer, we're looking at the interrelationships of the elements and their interdependence. Each element is dependent on other elements in order to for it to have optimal performance. It's kind of like us. It, it, you, you may eat the best diet in the world, but if you're doing other things, if you're not getting the exercise, you're not getting the sleep, you're getting lots and lots of stress, you're not, you're just, your environment, your lifestyle isn't optimal, then your performance won't be optimal. Uh, the reductionist and whole systems designs approaches are complementary methods, and they're both scientific methods. So they need to be used in conjunction. Ecological design process. Well, ecological design process basically means that, you know, let's not do any harm to the system when we're designing our system, do the minimal amount of harm as possible because after all, it is a living system. And when we're doing imposing ecological designs, and that's a big thing that I've done here on our demonstration site is we've, we've put in, in, in uh, incorporated in our system uh, what John Todd would call a living machine. And it's, it's bioremediation. We're removing 
um, things that are dangerous in our environment, if they get out in our environment, you know, such as um, organisms from composting or from chemicals in, in, in the manufacturing pro pro products that we, we have around, uh, certainly some of the pesticides and the foods that are around. Uh, so it's about uh, ecological design processes are trying to take and say, what is it that could potentially be doing some harm? How can we mitigate those, those factors and use those resources, direct them in the, posit the, the most beneficial direction? Comprehensive knowledge and skill sets. Those are things that permaculture strive to obtain. We're lifelong, I'm a lifelong learner, and many permaculturists are that way as well. They want to acquire as much knowledge and skills as they can throughout, throughout their lives. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> these are about using tools appropriately, selecting the best tool for the job. So. I use Google Earth, a computer, software, a drone, GPS, and maps. I use transit. I use a site compass. Uh, you know, I use an excavator. Uh, I don't use a key line plow, but I do have a tractor. There's many materials that I move around. I use a broad fork, a rotary harrow, tarps, and wheelbarrows. I use knives and sickles, machetes, scythes, uh, scythes uh, pruners, shovels, post hole diggers. Pens, notebooks, cameras, drawing equipment, recording uh, equipment. I use Evernote to, to keep notes in as well. And Wonderlist to take notes when I'm out in the field. So it's choosing the, the appropriate tool for the specific job that we're doing uh, and applying our knowledge set. So when we're talking about the, the appropriate approach for specific jobs, it's problem solving and decision making. Uh, clearly defining the goals and objectives, identifying the time and materials needed to accomplish a tech. Uh, what are we bringing to the table? What are the resources that we already have? What are the skills that we have? What, are, what, are, what is the knowledge base that we have? Identify other resources that we need to acquire or that we need to seek help outside of our inner circle. So as per, as a general guideline, I'd say that permaculture goes way beyond sustainable. We go to, I, I, you know, we can either be ordinary or extraordinary. And I think permaculturists strive for being extraordinary. They want to be regenerative, ad adaptive. We, we hear rewilding, all sorts of those sorts of terms. It's beyond just sustainable. We don't want to keep things as status quo. We want to improve things. Uh, Toby Hemingway really helped me to get my head around pattern literacy, and I'm, this is taking longer than I'd hoped it would do, so I'm going to breeze through the rest of this. But it's, it's, it's looking at, uh, you know, patterns in nature and patterns, you know, so uh, we can use patterns as a template uh, and have to recognize that behaviors are, are pa are, have patterns and, and they develop into habits and they can be uh, addictive in nature. Patterns are arranged, uh, are an arrangement of repeated elements. Patterns have rhythm. We can think about music and repeatable sizes and shapes. Patterns convey an underlying function or purpose of a design. Uh, patterns are models that guide a structure and function. Uh, patterns are, in, are informative and result in dynam are the result of dynamic interactions. The interaction of various forces create patterns. You know, we think about when the sun hits the earth. Well, that creates some heat as, it, as, as the uh, Earth's surface heats up and we get these air currents that, that develop as a result, convection, and then we get uh, winds and those winds start to uh, form waves and those waves start to cause erosion. Winds create patterns in, on the sand surface, ripples create the, the patterns of waves. And I could go on with this, but I'll, I'll stop there. But the important thing is that re rely, realize that uh, implied or forced forces uh, that interact create these patterns. Spirals form from continuous growth or expansion. We think about snails and all. Uh, fluids, uh, you know, ripples and waves have embodied energy in them. Uh, patterns should inspire us. They should please us. 
Those are things that we want to look at. We never want to force a pattern in a design. And I could go on at length about where I've seen patterns imposed in systems that really uh, are dysfunctional. They don't meet the needs of the people who live in it and therefore the expenses, the repair costs, those sorts of things are, are very significant. They're not, uh, when we impose a force in a design system merely because we like the appearance or the idea of that, of that pattern, often we're creating an issue where it's going to cost us more, be less efficient, and we won't spend the time there. Uh, zone awareness. Uh, the zones, in permaculture we use zones to, to tell us about, uh, we, we, we draw areas, uh, map sections around our home and around our property, and we call them zones. Zone zero would be inside the house because you spend the most amount of time in the house. You know, you're sleeping in there. Uh, it's very resource dependent. Whereas in zone five, well, in zone five, that's, that's your wilderness. You may only go out, out, go out there once or twice or three times a year. And I won't go in any further in it, but zones are very important when we're designing our systems in permaculture. Sector, uh, the sector assessment or sector analysis is also extremely important. It, it took me months to really lay everything down in one of my designs uh, with a sector assessment. And that really means uh, lots of work. The, the, the area where I went before with using a GPS, using a drone, using a camera, taking pictures, lots of notes, multiple times a year. We need, like in our area, we have cold, harsh winter winds. How are they impacting our structures, our buildings, our, our uh, cold frames, our greenhouses, and so on? The angle and orientation of the sun. We want to maximize the solar ex uh, exposure in the, in the northern hemisphere in the cold temperate climate. We want to have a lot of south facing glass so we can uh, spend less money on alternative sources of energy, on any source of energy other than the solar gain. Uh, we want to look at the snowfall accumulation. We have snowfall during our winters, tremendous amounts, which cover up our solar panels, which can increase a heavy snow load and get roof collapses. Uh, are you in a floodplain? Uh, what's a hundred year uh, flood uh, zone that you live in? What about droughts? What's the history of droughts? What about your water source? Where does your water come from? Is it coming from a polluted area? Are you near where someone's been doing uh, mining in a mountain and there's da dangerous chemicals that are in the water source? You may be miles away, but you may be affected by it. Maybe upstream is a non-point source of pollution where uh, industrial agriculture has had uh, antibiotic resistant microorganisms getting to get into the aquifer. What about extreme heat? How can you mitigate that? You know, how can, this is, when we look at sector analysis, we're thinking about how we can use it, how we can prevent it, what obstructions we can, can do. Like if there's a fire hazard, we really don't want to have a heavy forested area going right up to our structures. Uh, we really want to have fireproof zones or fire resistant zones. Uh, severe, severe weather events, you know, these include those hundred year events. You need to talk to the people around. You need to do, go into the uh, history records in your town area. The view, what are you looking at? Now, a lot of the times people will say, oh, I got this beautiful mountain view. Let's say it's on, we're in the northern hemisphere and it's on the north, north uh, face of the mountain, well, you're not going to get the, the solar exposure. So you need to know what your goals and aspirations are for your property and if you can deal with that. Uh, and certainly with, with views, you know, do you have a pig farmer right next door? I, ha I had that and the odors and smells are horrific. How about hazardous materials, a landfill? Yes, my next door neighbor uh, was a township and they had a landfill uh, that was closed in the, around 1970. Uh, and then now it's opened up as a gravel mine right next to the landfill zone. So those are things that I had to take into consideration and had to miti mitigate with bioremediation canal systems that I build on site. How about industrial agriculture, as I mentioned before? Are you gonna get those smells? Are you gonna get the sight of that? Are you gonna get the sounds of it? Are you, you know, all of those things we have to think about and even the non-point 
uh, sources of pollution if you're downstream from them or downwind from them. What about ordinances and zoning laws? Are they going to prevent you from being able to do the things that you want to accomplish? The slope of the land, how you or orient your garden beds so that they don't get completely soaked. But if you're in a desert area, you may want to have them perpendicular, uh, on contour rather, so that you can get as much moisture as possible. But where we are, we want the drainage. We, 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 we build permanent raised beds on our site. Uh, we need to take into account the climates and the microclimates. Is there a hillside? Is that cold air going to rush down and get stopped? And is that going to affect an early frost or, or a late frost in the area that you wanted to grow plants in? Taxes, what's the tax base in your area? So I think that covers everything for, for this point. So I hope this was helpful. I'll close up now and uh, well, that sums it up for my basic introduction to what I think permaculture is all about, at least a teaser for you. Know, for you. So if you like the content, the information I shared with you today, please leave a comment. Give me a thumbs up and share this video with your friends. Let me know, is this something you want to see more of? I've got lots of things to say about permaculture. I think it's amazing. It's a resourceful tool pack that we can carry with us once we learn to develop the skills and we increase our knowledge set. Well, thanks so much, folks, and have a great day. Bye-bye now.